have the skills to develop a specific statistical method to account for dropouts in their specific task, then there is a problem. So therefore, we think if we can perform genome-wide explicit imputation to overall improve the data quality, the improved data will be very useful for downstream bioinformaticians. So it is very important to adjust the false zero expression values due to dropouts. Before our work, there is a method magic on BioArchive in 2017. It is the first method for explicit and genome-wide imputation of single-cell RNA-seq gene expression data. It imputes missing expression values by sharing information across similar cells using a Markov transition matrix, which is used to determine the weight of different cells. And after we finish our manuscript, we also noticed two other methods. The one method called SAVER was developed by Nancy, Dr. Nancy Jones group at UPenn, who gave a talk two months ago. And the SAVER method is a Bayesian method that borrows information across genes. And they try to estimate the gene expression level in individual cells as parameters. And another method called Doctor Impute, which is also on BioArchive, it also borrows information across cells. And what they do is that they average multiple imputation results. So here I will introduce the motivation for our work. We have many two motivations. First, we think it is not ideal to alter all gene expressions. So we think that the altering values unlikely affected by dropouts might introduce new bias because there are a lot of technical bias and variances in sequencing itself. And this could also eliminate meaningful biological variation by making the heterogeneous, by making the heterogeneous cells too similar to each other. Our second motivation is that it is inappropriate to treat all zero expression values as missing values because some zero expressions may reflect truly biological non-expression. And also zero expressions could be resulted from gene expression stochasticity. Based on those two motivations, so our question is how to determine which zero expression values are likely affected by the dropout event. So now I will introduce our method, SC Impute. Our main idea is that for every gene, we want to determine which of its expression values are most likely affected by dropout event. Second, for each cell, we will perform the imputation. So what we do is that we will use the unlikely dropout genes to learn which cells are similar to the cell and then use those similar cells expression for the genes that need imputation to do the imputation. This diagram shows the idea. So you can see that for every gene, we first learn its chance of being dropout and doing that allows us to divide for each cell J to divide its genes into two sets, set AJ that need imputation and gene set BJ that doesn't need imputation. And then based on the genes in set BJ, we learn which cells are similar to the cell J. And based on this similarity, then we use the gene expression of the set AJ in those selected similar cells to impute the expression of AJ in cell J. So we will introduce the steps in detail, but this is a, just a general overview of our ideas. So first, for our method, we need some data pre-processing. The input to our method is a normalized and log transformed gene expression matrix. The reason we perform the log transformation is to make count data change that into continuous values because we have better statistical methods or statistical distributions for, for modeling continuous data. That's why we do that. And after our transformation, 
we actually add a constant before taking a log. So after our transformation, the transform values of gene i in cell j denoted by xij are now negative. So here we're just showing three examples from a fluidine single cell RNA seq real data of three genes. So we can see that for every gene, it is, its empirical distribution of expression values across different cells has a very interesting shape of a bimodal distribution. And this gives us an motivation to use this bimodal distribution to estimate how likely its expression in one cell is due to dropout. More examples. This is the data from a different data set. And also, we can see the same bimodal pattern still exists. So this motivation gave us this idea to use bimodal distribution to account for drop to estimate dropout probability. Before I talk that talk about that, I will first talk about the step we actually added to the second version of our paper. We didn't have this for our first version, but after we posted our work on bioarchive and several groups tried our method, give us very useful feedback. So we think this additional step one will be very useful. That is, we first perform some initial clustering on our cells before proceeding with our bimodal modeling, mixture modeling. So our idea is to first roughly find out which cells are similar before we do something else. So we first perform a dimensional reduction, PCA, on the transform gene expression matrix for dimension reduction. So we know that this PCA actually can be replaced by other dimension reduction techniques you think is more reasonable for single cell RNA seq data. But here, because this is just a rough clustering, we think PC gives reasonable results. And our second step is to calculate a Euclidean distance matrix between the cells based on the projected data in the two dimensional space. And then we detect outlier cells based on the distance matrix. So what we mean by outlier cells are the cells that are far away from other cells in the distance matrix. So the outlier cells could be a result of technical error or bias. And the outlier cell cells may also represent real biological variation as rare cell types. So for those outlier cells, we think we do not have enough information to impute its dropout because it's, un, it's not similar to other cells. So we cannot borrow information from other cells. And our fourth step is to cluster the cells by excluding the outliers and to cluster the remaining cells into K groups by spectral clustering. With this, then we will have some candidate clusters, and then for each cell J, its cells in the same cluster will be called its candidate neighbor set of cells. And we denote the set of cells as NJ. So second step, for each gene I, now we model its expression in the cell cluster K from our previous step as a random variable with a mixture of two density functions. So gamma and normal. We will see why those are reasonable. This is based on our empirical observation from the real data. And here, the weight for the gamma component, which we denote as lambda i k, i for the i gene, k for the k cluster, cell cluster, this is what we denote as gene i's dropout rate in cell population k. And then we estimate the parameters lambda i k, alpha i k, beta i k, mu i k, sigma i k as parameters using the expectation maximization EM algorithm by fitting the mixture model to the data. And with the estimates, we define the dropout probability of a gene I in cell J by this posterior probability using this formula. So one thing we want to make we note is that the estimated dropout rate lambda I K only depends on genes, but not on individual cells. But the estimated dropout probability, dij, depend on both genes and cells. So here we're missing the subscript k in the remote one. So this is 
the difference between dropout rate, which doesn't depend on cell, and dropout probability, which depends on cell. So this is to show how well our model fits to the data. So the black curve is the estimated mixture density, and the blue bars are the histogram based on real data. So this suggests that on this data set, the mixture model with gamma and Gaussian fits reasonably well to the real data. So with the DIJ we obtained from previous step, now we will select a gene set AJ for cell J, which means that the DIJs are large for those genes, suggesting that those genes need imputation. T is a threshold on dropout probabilities. And the default value, we set it to be 0 0.5. And BJ, on the other hand, are the cells, or sorry, are the genes which doesn't have high dropout probabilities in cell J. So we say they don't need imputation. You may wonder why 0 0.5 is a reasonable value. Here we are showing the distribution of dropout probabilities of all genes in one cell, two cell, three cell, and four cells. So we can see that a lot of the DIJs are either very close to zero or very close to one. So therefore, setting the threshold 0 0.5 will make our method pretty robust to this threshold because if you change to 0 0.4 or 0 0.6, the result doesn't change too much. So our step three. After we have the AJ and BJ, now we'll start our imputation. So for each cell J, we will first learn which cells in its candidate neighbor set NJ are similar to it based on the gene set BJ. What we do is that we will find the similar cells among NJ by fitting a non-negatively square regression. Because of the non-negativity, this regression will enforce sparsity on the estimated coefficients of candidate neighbor cells. So some of them will be forced to zero. And the non-zero coefficients will indicate the similar cells we will use for imputation. So with this, and then we finally estimate the, actually we should say predict the expression values of genes in AJ, in cell J, as follows. So for genes in cell in, in set AJ, what we do is that we take the coefficient estimate from the non-negative least squares and multiply that by this design matrix, which actually is the expression values of those genes AJ in other neighbor set cells. But for genes in set BJ, we just keep their original values and don't change it. So now I will switch to Vivian and let her introduce the results in the paper. All right, this is Vivian, and uh, uh, we have evaluated the s impute method based on multiple data sets and in different scenarios. And next, I will briefly introduce our main results. So in the first case study, uh, we use a data set that contains 3,005 cells from the mouse cortex region. And a good feature of this data set is that it contains 57 different ERCC spiking transcripts, which are the synthetic transcripts um, that are added to the RNA library before the sequencing step. Since these spiking transcripts have known concentration values, people can use them to study the uh, accuracy of different RNA sequencing experiments. And in this example, we randomly selected four single cells from the data set for illustration. And in the first row, we're displaying the raw rate count and the true abundance levels of the ERCC spikings in the raw data uh, using the gray color. And in the second row, we're displaying the uh, imputed rate count after the application of S input versus the true concentration using the blue color. So if we First, look at the raw data. We can observe multiple dropout events along the x axis in all the four cells, and these are uh, largely due to the uh, small amount of mRNA molecules in individual cells. But after the application of S input, we can see that for, for all the spiking transcripts that have 
positive concentration values, they also have positive read count. And this shows that as input is able to correctly recover the uh, abundance levels of ERCC spikings in single cell data. And in our second example, uh, we evaluate the performance of S input using the expression of cell cycle genes. And the data set we use contains 182 embryonic stem cells that have been staged for cell cycle phases G1, S, or G2M. And in the human genome, there are about 900 genes that are annotated to have important functions during cell cycles. So we should expect these cell cycle genes to have non-zero expression in these embryonic stem cells. However, if we look at um, six example cell cycle genes and we plotted the, their raw gene expression values using the violin plots and the raw data are represented by the dark red, uh, green and blue. And we can see that a significant proportion of the gene expression values are zero or very close to zero due to the dropout events. So we apply S input on this data set and the imputed uh, read counts are denoted as the light colors. And we can see that after the application of S input, the gene expression values of these cell cycle genes are corrected and now they have non-zero expression which are more consistent with our expectation. And in the third study, we compare different imputation methods in the context of differential gene expression analysis based on a simulated data set. In this simulation, we assume that there are three cell types, C1, C2, and C3, each with 50 cells. And we also assume that among a total of 20,000 genes, 810 genes are truly differentially expressed, with one-third having higher expression in each cell type. Then to simulate the single cell data, we first generate a complete data by simulating gene expression values from normal distributions and then shifting the mean expression of the, uh, of the 810 true DE genes. And this complete data does not involve any dropout issues. Then to create a single cell uh, count matrix that have dropout values, we randomly introduce zero values into the complete data. And while doing this, we assume that the dropout rate of a gene is higher when its mean expression, xi bar, is, um, is smaller. And this is also an assumption that is used in the, in the ZIFA dimension reduction method. After we introduce the dropout values, we refer to the count matrix as the raw data. And then we apply three different imputation methods as input, magic, and saver to the raw data and compare their performance. So here, let's first uh, look at the, the first row, which represents the first two principal com components resulted from PCA based on the complete data, the raw data, and the imputed data by as input, magic, and saver. If we look at the complete data, the three cell types can be clearly distinguished in the first two dimensions because of the DE genes. However, in the raw data, due to the existence of the dropout values, it becomes more difficult to separate the three cell types. And after we apply S input to the data set, again, we can obtain a very clean clustering results in the first two dimensions. And in comparison, MAGIC would introduce this data structure between the three cell types that does not exist in the complete data. And SAVER does not have a very clear impact in the first two dimensions in this example. And in the second row, we're displaying the expression profiles across the three cell types using the heat maps. We can see that the upregulated genes in each cell type can be clearly differentiated um, using the heat map in complete data. But this expression dynamics is masked in the raw data. And after we apply S input, we are able to uncover the gene expression dynamics of the true DE genes. And on the other hand, if we look at the uh, imputed data by MAGIC, the three cell types become very similar and this shows that MAGIC actually has an over smoothing effect in this example. So we have compared the three methods uh, based on simulated data and next 
we evaluate how the different um, imputation methods can assist the analysis um, based on real single cell data. And we collected both single cell and bulk heuristic data from the human embryonic stem cells and the definitive endoderm cells. In summary, the bulk data contains six samples and the single cell data contains 350 individual cells. The percentage of zero expression in the raw data is 49.1% in single cell data, which is much higher than 14.8% in bulk data. And this high percentage of zero expression brings many challenges to the DE analysis. What we do is that since the uh, ground truth of the DE genes is unknown in this example, we take those DE genes that are identified from the bulk data and use them as the gold standard and compare the accuracy of DE analysis based on single cell data. So let's first look at the results of differential gene expression analysis. If we compare against the gold standard uh, extracted from the bulk data, then as input and magic both have a higher F1 score um, compared to the raw data in terms of the accuracy of uh, the identification. And if we compare the two methods, um, the as input method tends to uh, give a higher precision rate, while the magic method tends to give a higher recall rate. And this example is based on a DE method called MAST that is uh, specifically designed for single cell data. And to confirm that the, uh, the genes that are identified from the imputed data are really biologically meaningful, we take those DE genes that can be only discovered from the imputed data by S input, but not in the raw data, and perform gene ontology enrichment analysis. And if we use DE-seq2 to identify the DE genes, then we can identify some enriched goal terms such as tube formation, digestive tract development, and gland development. And all these enriched goal terms are highly relevant to the functions of, of endoderm cells. Similarly, if we use mast to, the, to identify the DE genes, we can also observe some enriched goal terms that are relevant to the biological function of endoderm cells. And on the contrary, if we take the genes, take the DE genes that can be only identified in the raw data, but not in the imputed data, we are not able to identify these meaningful uh, enriched goal terms. So this result suggests that as input can assist the differential gene expression analysis single cell studies and help us identify biologically meaningful differentially expressed genes. And next, I want to discuss two examples to illustrate how s input can assist the clustering of, of cells in single cell study. The first example involves a smaller data set that contains 268 single cells from the mouse embryos. And these single cells can be roughly divided into 10 different developmental stages. In this study, we also apply s input magic and saver to the raw data without using the true labels. And then we extract the first two principal components from the PCA uh, method based on the four data sets, and then perform spectral clustering based on the first two PCs. Then to evaluate the clustering results, we compare the clustered labels with these two developmental stages um, based on four different measures, the adjusted RAND index, JCURT index, normalized mutual information, and the purity score. All the four measures has a value between zero and one, with zero indicating a complete mismatch and one indicating a perfect match. And we can see that the blue bar corresponding to the S input method is the highest in almost all cases, showing that S input leads to the best clustering results in this example. And uh, our second example involves a larger data set uh, that, that was generated using the 10x genomics platform. And it contains 4,500 blood mononuclear cells. And the proportion of zero expression in the raw data is as high as 92.6%, making it very difficult to separate 
um, the different cell subtypes in the raw data. So we can first look at the first two dimensions resulted from the TSNI method based on the raw data. And we can see that, for example, on the left side, the cytotoxic T cells and the naive cytotoxic T cells are grouped together. In the middle, the memory T cells, the helper T cells, regular T cells, and the naive T cells also form a large group. However, after we apply S input and also do the dimension reduction, we can see that different immune cell types can be separated based on first two dimensions. And we also tried uh, uh, the magic method and saver on the same data set, but was not able to achieve comparable results. And this shows that S input can assist us to identify um, cell subpopulations in single cell studies, which can be very useful for many downstream analysis. And in our last case study, we discuss how S input can analyze the gene expression dynamics uh, in time course single cell data. And this time, we collected both bulk and single cell time course data profiled at different time points during the differentiation of of in embryonic stem cells into the endoderm cells. And in summary, the single cell data contains um, 758 single cells in total, and the bulk data contains 15 samples. First, as an overall evaluation, we compare the gene expression in single cell data with the average gene expression in bulk data by calculating the Pearson correlation coefficients. And we can see that at all the time points, the imputed data leads to better correlation scores. And I will show that this improvement in correlation is actually due to the fact that S input is able to recover the dropout events in single cell data. And we can look at some specific genes and um, due to time constraints, let's take the first gene as an example. So the black triangles here denotes the average gene expression in bulk data corresponding to the time point. And we can see that this gene actually its expression has an increasing trend along the time course. But if we look at the single cell data, which are represented by the box plus, in the raw data, the median value is always zero due to the dropout uh, due to the dropout issue in single cell data. So if we just analyze the raw data, it's very difficult to discover the expression pattern of this gene. However, after we apply S input to the data set, we can see that the imputed value actually also shows an increasing pattern along time course, which is consistent with the bulk data. And actually all the four genes are showing similar message. And this result suggests that the imputed rate counts by S input actually reflect more accurate gene expression dynamics along the time course. So above our, our main results and as a short summary, we propose a statistical method as input to address the dropout issue prevalence in single cell data. And the main feature of S input is that it only tries to impute the gene expression values that are highly likely uh, affected by the dropout events while trying to retain the expression levels of genes that are not affected by the dropout events. And the big the advantage of S input is that it is compatible with most existing pipelines and downstream analysis of single cell data. And it scales, scales up well when the number of cells and the number of genes increases. So our paper was published in uh, February at Nature Communications, and we have implemented this method in our package as input, which is available on GitHub. So any suggestions on our package are highly welcome. And finally, we would like to thank our collaborators, Dr. Mark Began at the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, and Drs. Robert Motley, Matteo Pellegrini, and Sha Yang, and their students at UCLA for their insightful suggestions and uh, discussions. And with, with, with that, uh, we would like to take any questions. Thank you. Thanks, Vivian, for her introduction. And also, I would like to thank our funding agencies as well. And if you have any questions, we are here to answer.
Go ahead, Liu Ke. Since raised his hand. Ah、uh, yes. Can you hear me? <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. So it's really great work. So um. Thank you. I just wonder um since now the SQL input is input is borrowing the information from the cells within the same batch. Could you apply this method on different batches? Because I think when you did the PCA analysis. The battery effects will dominate the cluster. Is that correct?、Uh, so what we think is that for well, because the data, the gene expression matrix we work with is generated from one single cell experiment. So therefore,、mm -hmm. we don't think there are batch effects of different labs and different experiments. But if you talk about whether the values of different cells. Measuring one experiment are comparable, so that's why we said said that the normalization methods other people have developed, like the SC norm, etc., could be applied to the data first, and then they can use the normalized data as input into our imputation method. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Dong Mei Li since raised his hand. Uh, go ahead. Uh, sure. Uh, just have a question. Like, whether you can elaborate more, like, why you say the other two methods is not、uh, cannot get comparable results when you do clustering. Um. Okay. So let me move back to the clustering slide Vivian introduced. Um. So I assume you're talking about this one, right? Uh no, it's the next one. This one, this one doesn't actually. We didn't show the two other methods results, right? Maybe you can explain. Right. Yeah. Because like you said, it's not comparable.、Yeah. Right. So basically, we tried both uh magic and saver, and uh, saver uh did not give us a result after over overnight running. And magic um did uh also generate an imputed count matrix. But after we apply the Tisney method on imputed data, the first two dimensions are,、uh, give us a very scattered results. Basically, the the、uh, the similar the the cells in the in the same cell type does not group into one cluster, so we're not displaying the results here. I see. Thank you. Thank you. So hello, this is、uh, Jin again.、Um, so I have、uh, a few questions. The first one is,、uh, how does the SC impute method work differently on single cell RNA seq data generated by like different platforms? Yeah. So that's a very good question. So in our case studies, we cover data generated by both fluidine and Droplet-based、uh, microfluidic, but we can see that the results on microfluidic data, which has higher dropout rates, still have room for improvement. Just as Vivian said, if we look at this data set right here, the proportion of zero expression is as high as almost 92, 93 percent. So that's why in this case we are we think that we may need. More ways to borrow information to do better for drop for droplet-based technologies, and also we talked with people who also work on those data, and they said that a very different thing between droplet-based microfluidic and the fluidine is that for microfluidic you don't have that amplification step, so therefore your your read count is more. Like zero, one, two, but but not very high. So therefore, we can also think about modification in our mixture model. Okay, yeah, thank you.
And so for so SC input, uh, it seems to uh, very important to find all those neighbors because you in, input based on the uh, distribution of genes uh, of all, all its uh, neighbor uh, cells. So uh, it's uh, like uh, as the input sensitive to the number of clusters, like uh, the K and uh, how the how to set the K in real practice. Uh, yes, so uh, we, we actually perform a sensitive, sensitivity analysis uh, on both the, the number of clusters and also the threshold for dropout, dropout values based on our, our example here. Um, so if you could go up. Yeah, based on this, um, this data of mouse embryos and uh, uh, we, we didn't list the, the, the results here, but it's in our paper and Basically, um, our conclusion is that as input is not very sensitive to the selection of the dropout threshold. Um, and for the number of clusters, even though uh, a good uh, number of clusters as the initial value would, of course, assist the downstream analysis, um, as input is not highly dependent on this selection because we have uh, a second step of um, non-negative least square regression to further select the, the really similar uh, the really similar cells and predicted predictive cells from the uh, candidate neighbor sets but um, our general suggestion is that um, if you want s input to be more conservative then it's better to select a relatively larger k based on the initial clustering of raw data because in that case, s input will borrow information from less cells. However, if you think um, the, the true number of clusters in the data is much more, then you can use the smaller and s input will try to borrow information from the cells. Yeah, so K can actually be interpreted as a regularization parameter, which controls how much do you want to impute. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Hi, uh, just a minute again. Uh, sorry, uh, I have another question I want to ask you about like, uh, uh, when you're using, uh, like at the beginning you said, you will kind of like uh, uh, borrow the information from similar cells, yeah. um, like to impute, right? Yes. Um, I want to ask uh, what is the criteria of selecting the similar cells? Uh, is it based on the cell function or is that on the cells? Okay. Uh, yeah, that's a very good question. What we do is that we use this step. So the similar cells were selected based on the genes in BJ, and then we use their expression values in the neighboring cells, and we use the non-negative least square to select the similar cells. Basically, the ones whose coefficient estimates have non-zero has non-zero values. So therefore, the similar cells were selected among the candidate neighbor cells of cell J. And what we use is based on the genes in the PJ. I see. So if there are many kind of non-zero coefficients, uh, right. then, then you just take an average of that? If there are many, then we just use the coefficient estimates we got from here, which we call beta hat J. And those coefficients are actually used as sort of like weights to actually averaging the gene expression in those similar cells. I see, got it. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Yeah, I have another question about the uh, imputation. Um, so can the imputation step be like replaced by uh, any other methods such as uh, uh, like a matrix completion? Oh, yes. This is something we have thought about and that, that is exactly right. So after we are second step, I think, okay, right here. After we identify, after we estimate those DIJ, so then we can set a threshold on DIJ so we can decide, okay, these values in the matrix are the ones we want to impute. And then, as you said, we can treat those as missing values and then we can use matrix completion algorithms for sure. The reason we use this step three, our approach is because we also want to give users a reasonable interpretation about what cells are used 
to impute the cell. So therefore, the, the similar cells selected by our method can also have biological interpretation and may be useful for downstream users. Okay, so that means also the parameters can also be like interpreted as the, like biological. Right, right. So you basically, you will get for every individual cell, you will get how what are the selected similar cells and what are their weights. So this can be interpreted as a way to to, to look at the cell cell relationship. I think, but if you say like if we use other methods for matrix completion like the the rank-based method that is trying to minimize the nuclear norm subject to the similarity between the company one and the original one. If we use those approach, then our objective is basically to minimize the rank, right? So that's something we think not specifically related to the biological question. So that's why we didn't use those methods in the end. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Does anyone have other question? Yeah. Okay, uh, let's all thank to our speaker, Dr. Lee and Vivian uh, for the great talk, very inspiring. Thank you for inviting us to speak. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, if no other questions, um, uh, I guess that's all for today. And uh, if you have any, uh, as a question, please contact speaker by email. Um, yeah, so, feel free to contact us. <laughs> yeah. If you have any questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, so uh, thanks for attending our webinar and uh, we will send out, um, send out the detailed information for our next event shortly. Um, yeah, I think that's for today. Thank you very much. Thank you.